global connections. I'm Dr. Alison Goff, I'm the Dean of the Honours Program at Hawaii Pacific University and today it's my distinct pleasure to swap roles with your usual ho host and my colleague Dr. Patrick Bratton, also a professor at Hawaii Pacific University, Associate Professor of uh, Political Science. Welcome mm -hmm. Patrick. Well, thank you Alison. And um, we're going to kind of switch gears from the last conversation we had which was uh, a fun conversation about um, uh, various uh, film noir in the mm -hmm. uh, pre and post war period. Not that this conversation won't be fun, but mm -hmm. uh, um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, your research interests because um, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this because mm -hmm. you are uh, particularly focused on India. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested to know how, it, how you got to, to that topic given, given your background. Okay, it's kind of a funny story. The, the joke I give often with my students is oftentimes when you meet people who specialize in India or South Asia, and there's often some sort of personal sort of spiritual journey where they went and to an ashram and found themselves mm -hmm. with a yoga or something like that. And that's not, not my, my case at all. I didn't actually have a formative training in sort of India or South Asia. Mm -hmm. But there was always kind of an interest. So when I was taking classes as an undergrad, um, I always was interested in the region, interested in the history uh, about it. Uh, and then kind of coincidentally, a couple of things came together when I was at graduate school. Um, my graduate research was on sort of course of diplomacy, mm -hmm. uh, coercion, these types of things. And one of the things that was interesting was that I found that at the same time I was working on this topic, which actually funnily wasn't very um, a la mode in American right. academia at the yeah. time when I was working. But I started, as I did my literature search, as we all do uh, during our dissertation, I found there were all these Indians writing about the topic mm -hmm. and they were really interested. And I thought, well, it's kind of interesting that they're interested in the same kind of intellectual debates, policy debates mm -hmm. that I'm in. And so it got me kind of wondering why they were interested in this and got me interested in reading what Indians Indians and other South Asians were writing about security and foreign mm -hmm. policy. At the same time uh, that was going on, my wife actually is a lawyer, was working at a South Asian law firm in mm -hmm. DC. And she was mostly doing uh, immigration cases. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the immigration cases she was doing was sort of asylum issues for people who were suffering persecution in various countries mm -hmm. in South Asia, uh, particularly for Christian minority groups mm -hmm. um, who were persecuted uh, for various reasons. And so when she was writing up these um, asylum briefs, because I was, you know, a, a graduate student in international politics, she'd asked me for background about Nepal or Pakistan or these mm -hmm. Bangladesh, and it got me re interesting about reading about these topics to kind of give her background mm -hmm. materials and things to help her. Uh, and those two things came at the same time, and I got really interested in the region and how people were looking. And also, too, generally, one of the things um, we've, we've, we've talked about on the show, and I've talked with some other guests, you know, oftentimes people in universities, we tend to have internal debates within our own country, mm -hmm. right? So American historians talk to other American historians, right. but they might not talk to British historians, yeah, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, and so it got me interested in like how Americans or Western scholars were covering uh, topics mm -hmm. differently, say, than Indian scholars yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah. So that's where... Oh, interesting. So, uh, did you find yourself working on this in isolation? Because I know when, when I did my PhD, I, did, I, I was, uh, well, when I did my undergraduate, I was interested in American history. And at, at the time, you know, not a lot of universities were doing that. And so, if you were doing American history, you were working with a very small kind of coterie of scholars. So, did you have much support uh, from the American end? It you know, yes and no, like the, the dissertation advisor I had, that was one of his mm -hmm. topics, so he was really great. But, you know, I'd go to conferences and there'd be kind of a token amount of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and in a sense, it wasn't a big topic. And it's funny because in the past five or ten years, the subject has come back. Mm -hmm. And now that yeah. I'm not working on that subject as much, it's I'm like, wow, is that the wrong place? You know, trying mm -hmm. to bring back bell bottoms at the wrong time or something, <laughs> right? You know? Oh, yeah. I missed it by five years, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but at the time, I agreed. I mean, it was something where, yeah, I mean, there were some people working on it. At the time, um, this, to kind of take our way back time machine, this was sort of in the mid-aughts, yeah, I guess, yeah. early to mid-aughts. Mm -hmm. And so sort of in a post-9-11 world, um, you know, there was a lot of interest in sort of terrorism, political Islam, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these types of things uh, with the Iraq War and all yeah. this stuff. Um, there was a policy debate going on about coercion, but it hadn't mm -hmm. filtered to the academic mm -hmm. uh, yeah. debate as much. Yeah, and this is a period, as I understand it, where India is, is changing its foreign policy mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about coercive diplomacy in the context okay. of India? Because obviously that's <laughs> an <laughs> initial area of interest. I understand mm. your interest have kind of shifted 
made sense. Um, well, one of the things uh, I'll put on my, my pointy academic mm -hmm. hat for a second. Um, does it ever come off? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the, the interest that India had in it is that traditionally, if we look at sort of Indo-Pakistani mm -hmm. security relations, there's a, a familiar dynamic that happened throughout the Cold War in that um, some event would happen. Um, normally, because Pakistan's the smaller, weaker state, it tends to have a slightly more, one could say, sort of forward-leaning or more aggressive posture in mm -hmm. a sense that it feels that it has to act quickly mm -hmm. in order to act against a much larger India. So India would always be reactive to some crisis with Pakistan for the most part. Uh, and then it would always have this fallback card that it was bigger. Mm -hmm. And so if Pakistan, we get in a fight, eventually we'll mobilize our big military and we'll go smush. Uh, the Pakistani military. And that was always sort of the, 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 the default mechanism. Right. Now, one of the two things that happens very interesting at the end of the 80s into the 1990s is you have a simultaneous twin development mm -hmm. in South Asia where both the Pakistanis start having some relationship with sort of violent uh, non-state non mm -hmm. actors um, who commit, say, maybe terrorist acts inside of India, particularly in Kashmir or other places, at the same time that both India and Pakistan become overtly nuclear. And so this twin developments call this traditional Indian policy of mobilizing the military to threaten Pakistan into question. Mm -hmm. And so what the Indians were very interested in sort of the end of the 90s, in the beginning of the aughts, the time period that I was working my PhD, um, they were interested in how can we utilize the strength that we have, the military military strength we have, the diplomatic strength we have, in a way short of war, mm -hmm. to get back what the Indians called a sort of a search for strategic space uh, ag against Pakistan. And that's where their interest in coercive diplomacy mm -hmm. came. And in many ways that dovetails work the interest in the U.S. got right. in coercive diplomacy. Again, once the U.S. and the Soviet Union could basically annihilate each other mm -hmm. in the 1960s, was there some way to still think about force or the threat of force in some way short of war that mm -hmm. would still be useful mm -hmm. for the United States? Mm -hmm. So it's a similar sort of a scenario that developed into the sort of academic and policy research. Oh, I see. So this was your initial area mm -hmm. of research. So where have you taken your research uh, more recently? Um, one, one, things, one thing that got me was the, um, I mean, India's, this is almost like cliche, but mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting in the sense that it's a very complicated um, society uh, and a very complicated history and political system. And so the more that I was looking at India and saying, oh, well, I think the diplomats work like this, and the government works like this, and the military works like this. I'd come back a year later, do more research, say, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> so I would constantly find that it was much more complicated uh, than I thought it was. And so I got very intrigued, in, um, and this kind of dovetails with some of my other mm -hmm. intellectual interests, about the different ways countries organize sort of their national security and foreign policy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So what is the relationship that the U.S. has with its military, its diplomats? How is that similar or different to Britain mm -hmm. or to France or Japan or, in this case, mm -hmm. India? And I got very interested in how civil military relations works in India, or one could say doesn't mm -hmm. work at times, uh, and how India is also... Is as you alluded to earlier, changing its role in the yeah. international sphere as it sort of is a rising yeah. power. So, so what do you think is the driving force between civil-military relations in India? <laughs> and, and how, does, how does that compare? Because it, it seems that a lot of your work is comparative, right? Mm. So this is what is interesting mm. uh, about this. And India obviously is an understudied, uh, at least, area in terms of international relations in the West. So. Right. Um, it's interesting. India is, a, is an interesting paradox, mm -hmm. in a sense, for civil mill. Because if you look at s the developing world writ large, and particularly South Asia and Southeast Asia, um, civil military relations has a problem with praetorianism, with mm -hmm. military institutions that take over and throw coups and take over uh, the government, or behind the scenes influence civilian mm -hmm. leadership and things. So whether it's Thailand, Pakistan, Bangladesh, any of these countries, there's this problem with sort of praetorianism mm -hmm. in the military. And India's never had this problem. And so from you know the, the start of Indian democracy, arguably with independence in 47, although there's democracy in a form earlier, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a problem with, the, with praetorianism in the military. So on the one hand, there's this great shining success story of civilian control of the military, the way that people in the West would want to see in the mm -hmm. U.S. or Britain or, or wherever. 
On the flip side, there's this kind of weird separation between policymakers and the military where they don't really talk or coordinate that well mm -hmm. in the system. And so one of the struggles has been as India becomes a, a rising power, can this relationship where they don't talk to each other uh, in a sense and have a kind of antagonistic mm -hmm. relationship, can is that still the best mm -hmm. model in a sense? Okay. So you, you say that India doesn't have this history of praetorianism like mm -hmm. most of Southeast Asia. So is that a legacy of its imperial past or, oh. or <laughs> where does that come from? That's an interesting question. Uh, there, there, arguably there is this longer tradition culturally in India about the relationship the military has with rulers and things. And uh, there are some debates on that, that mm -hmm. this goes back thousands of years. But if we go back to the more recent times, sort of 19th, 20th century, a lot of this has its origins actually in sort of the, in sort of the, the British Raj and mm -hmm. sort of the reaction against British imperialism. In many instances, because Britain had a very large Indian army, right? So you have this army that's mostly soldiered and by the 20th century increasingly officered by mm -hmm. Indians themselves in the service of, of, of the British crown. Um, the, in, the military, in a sense, seemed to be one of these sort of shiny examples of British colonial power. Mm -hmm. And so unlike a lot of other countries, the elites that came to be the, to, who were pushing for independence in, in India were not military men. Like in a lot of other countries in the 30s, 40s, 50s, we've got revolutionary fighters, you know, whether it's in, you know, Myanmar or Indochina, mm -hmm. people who are going to take power back for the people by the power of the gun. The, the Indian elites who were pushing for independence, you know, were by and large almost completely non-military mm -hmm. men, and they did it without arms. Yeah. And so there's not really this history in India mm -hmm. of the sort of militant revolutionary mm -hmm. the way you would have in Algeria yeah, yeah. or something. And also there's this lingering suspicion at the time, and I would argue still that the political classes have, that the Indian military is this kind of last bastion of the Raj. Mm. In, in, in India, and it, 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 some of this is kind of apparent if you watch like Indian military parades on Republic Day mm -hmm. uh, in, in January. I mean, the Indian military in some ways remains culturally very British with yeah. bagpipes and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. swagger sticks mm -hmm. and, and sort of things. I mean, I have a, a bunch of uh, both serving and retired Indian uh, military officers as friends, and it's, it's sometimes with some of them, and I don't mean this in a, 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 in a mocking way, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because I grew up with a lot of these World War II movies. My yeah, yeah. mom likes espionage yeah. movies. And there are just times I could imagine a lot of these, particularly like the, the Air Force pilots, you know, with a white scarf and <laughs> shot down two Messerschmitts, what, what, and had a brandy, you know, sort of thing. And it's, yeah. it, it's, and so for a lot of the political classes, there's mm -hmm. still this, these guys seem very, in a sense, um, trapped in another time yeah. and maybe not imbued with the spirits of democracy. Mm -hmm. I don't actually, I actually think that these views are, are relatively problematic, but that's sort of the viewpoint in a sense, that the military is the sort of bastion of leftover British okay. colonialism. Well, we'll be exploring some more of your research because mm -hmm. I know you have the things to talk about, about the Navy. I think you've got an interest mm -hmm. in that. Uh, after we go to a couple of messages. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not otherwise have met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday.
Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Global Connections. I'm Dr. Alison Goff, and I'm here talking to my colleague, Dr. Patrick Bratton, about his intellectual adventures <laughs> in India, and we'll get to his actual physical adventures in India in a minute. Uh, but before the break, we were talking about um, you know, coercive diplomacy and your other uh, research interests. And I know recently you've become more interested in uh, naval policy mm -hmm. uh, in India and in the, in the region. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that came about and what particularly you're looking at in that area? Okay, it's an interesting question. I mean, one of the things that that has often been sort of missing uh, in in India since independence mm -hmm. has been a focus on maritime yeah. issues in the Indian mm -hmm. Ocean. And part of that uh, is kind of explains, there's several reasons for that. And one of the reasons is, is that India sort of is a land power with sort of disputed borders mm -hmm. with Pakistan and China, naturally had sort of more uh, territorial security uh, preferences. But there's uh, other parts of it that are missing that I think um, people miss out on when they're looking at it. And that in many ways, countries that build up strong navies or strong maritime power, and normally, I, this will sound kind of tautological, have maritime interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And India at independence was trying to pursue a sort of autarkic, um, sort of state-led development without trade. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't trade, uh, you don't really need right. a navy, yeah. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so because of the, the particular development path that India was on uh, throughout most of the Cold War, it didn't need, uh, it didn't need a navy, yeah. in a sense. Now that India is sort of opening up to the global economy, mm -hmm. it's sort of wanting to have a larger say uh, sort of in its own mm -hmm. region and also to protect uh, the, the trade that goes on, and so there's been this interest in it. And it's been an interesting shift, um, if you will. So there's been an investment uh, in the Navy. There's looking now with the new government investment in the shipbuilding industry, mm -hmm. ship repair industry, and so on, to try and lay in pieces to be more of a maritime uh, state. But it's, it's a long path. In a sense, I mean, you know, uh, the, the Royal yeah. Navy did not come. Right, <laughs> and they're, they're coming from behind. So, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And this is this is this causing, you know, issues with the you know economy and you know the, the budget mm -hmm. um, are there. I mean, there is, there are factions that are pushing hard for this right now. Obviously, competing factions. Yeah. On this. yeah. So the, definitely, I mean, the you know the traditional uh, sort of um, in terms of military usage, the you know the army and so on. They say, hey, we mm -hmm. you know the police forces we've got terrorism, we've got yeah. border issues, we should have the have more of a slice of the pie. There's also the traditional um, you know, infrastructure development, all of these right. other things that are a great uh, pull on the economy mm -hmm. as well. So, But there has been, I think, particularly in recent years, a view in the government that India needs to have a larger trade role mm -hmm. and that maritime issues writ large yeah. Are kind of a vital part of that. So, has this done anything to worsen or better civil military relations? <laughs> because one would think, you know, given given you know India's propensity to trade with the world, then it, they might have civilian support, given that one needs right this mm -hmm. this, this maritime fleet right to yeah. protect world trade. So. It can ah. I think so, and I yeah. think the, one of the things that's interesting, the Indian Navy has a much better relationship with some of the civilian industries mm. um, yeah. in, uh, in terms of um, having the Indian shipbuilding industry provide ships for the mm -hmm. Navy. That relationship is sort of the success story. We're often like the Army and the Air Force have had sort of terrible relationships with civilian or government suppliers. Mm -hmm. and. Also, there's a kind of a natural cosmopolitanism with mm -hmm. navies, in a sense yeah. that they're sort mm -hmm. of, not to say that they're a non-military military service, right, right. Yeah. but they see, tend to have an ability to sort of interact with civilians mm -hmm. in the civilian world in, in a better way than, say, mm -hmm. I think a more traditional sort of particularly like the right. army that tends to be much more, I mm -hmm. guess, military mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we kind of talk about your intellectual kind mm -hmm. of journey to India, and um, we've been showing some photographs behind oh. us. There, there's the man himself, uh, <laughs> the Institute of Foreign Policy Studies. So let's talk a little bit about the actual physical, you know, journey to sure. India, because obviously you have to go there to do a lot mm -hmm. of archival research and, and, and interviews, I presume, mm -hmm. w w with that. What are we looking at here? So um, this is I, this is the Ambien Mall in Gurgaon, uh -huh. I believe, yeah. and this is interesting because this is one of these huge mega malls. It's mm -hmm. one of the largest malls in the world that's built out in these suburbs in India. And so you see kind of an example of sort of the India, the shining India mm -hmm. that the government would like to portray to the world. That this is you know not the India of. Um, 
Mother Teresa and yeah, so on. Yeah, Calcutta, uh, and, which is the, honestly mm. is the image that a lot of people right, mm. have of India, yeah, who have not been there, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so yeah. this is one of these malls where they're, you know, they're showing mm -hmm. where the upper middle class can go and buy, you know, the same goods that we buy yeah. in Waikiki. Well, although yeah. I don't buy them in Waikiki, <laughs> but anyways, other people, tourists can buy Prada and so on. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting contrast, you know, when you, I mean, that's, I think the interesting thing in India is that you have um, some areas and some places where the infrastructure, the development, mm -hmm. I mean, you could be in you could be in Seoul yeah. you could mm -hmm. be in, in mm -hmm. any uh, Tokyo or wherever mm -hmm. and you then you still have you still have other areas of India where you go where you know there is poverty yeah. infrastructure is crumbling mm -hmm. um, and these things and you'll often see them sort of juxtapose yeah. Uh, yeah. with each other mm -hmm. Um, so what are we looking at here? Uh, this is India Gate. Um, uh -huh. This is sort okay. of the, the India's Arc de Triomphe, and yes. it was built. Uh, it was built by the British mm -hmm. uh, in memory of war dead, and mm -hmm. the Indian, the Indi independent India has kept that tradition, and that's they've got a, a, a flame for the unknown soldier, mm -hmm. uh, and that's sort of a centerpiece of yeah. Luton's Delhi, the new Delhi that the mm -hmm. neoclassical sort of art deco yeah. uh, deli that was built in the 1930s. Yeah, a lot of that monumental architecture really is still very. Uh, British-like mm. in some ways. And, and this one? This is interesting. Uh, I went to uh, Mumbai, Bombay, mm -hmm. earlier this year, my first time going to M Mumbai. And I have, a, as we've kind of talked, I have a weakness for Art Deco. Yeah. And uh, Mumbai has some of the best, well, most well-preserved areas of Art Deco mm. in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And so this was this really interesting sort of Assyrian yeah, that's, themed. My, that's my first <laughs> thought when I was looking at that. It looks like these monumental, you know, horsemen from mm. the ancient Assyria. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it looked, it was mm -hmm. this, this elaborate building that was very Assyrian or Babylonian mm -hmm. sort of themed. Okay. Um, and, and, and more examples of this here. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a fascinating, again, fascinating contrast to mm -hmm. go and see uh, th these beautiful buildings and then it's, and, and it's interesting because a lot of the architects and the builders of these buildings were Indian. Mm -hmm. And so you see this interesting sort of fusion of Western yeah. and Asian mm -hmm. um, motifs in, mm -hmm. in this Art Deco. I mean, similar to some of the Art Deco fusion we have here in Hawaii, yeah, which yeah. has a mixture of yeah. Western and, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, and uh, Asian uh, yeah. sort of influences. So which areas have you traveled to um, most? Where, um, where is a lot of your research kind of Mostly focused? Delhi. I mean, yeah. Delhi, because it's the capital city, yeah. and the foreign policy mm -hmm. security is sort of concentrated there. So I'm almost always passing through Delhi, yeah. uh, spending a lot of time there. But the one of the traps, though, with India is that um, it is so big, it's mm -hmm. so diverse. And if you do foreign policy stuff, you, you naturally have to spend time in Delhi. And so right. there's this kind of, you can get trapped in Delhi, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a sense. Um, oh, oh. oh, this is me. Um, I, I, this is one of my mm -hmm. one of my finest moments, maybe. Um, <laughs> I was uh, interviewing, or not interviewing, was at a conference uh -huh. with Mr. Jay Shankar, and this oh. at mm -hmm. that time he was the Indian ambassador to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and he's now the Indian Foreign Secretary mm -hmm. under Modi. Uh, and he's an unbelievably uh, interesting, very intelligent, very mm -hmm. urbane uh, gentleman. And he comes from a very influential family. His father was sort of the Indian Henry Kissinger, for lack mm. of a better term, sort mm -hmm. of the doyen of their strategic yeah, yeah. community. Uh, and him and his brother is a very well-known Indian historian. Mm. Uh, and so this was a, it was actually over at the East West Center. Mm. And so oh, he was so the, mm. this was here. Okay, so you brought him in, or he was? Uh, no, he happened yeah. to be on a tour when he oh. was uh, ambassador, and he mm -hmm. came to the East West Center, and so got to ask him some questions about the bureaucracy, and he seemed to have fun actually answering questions <laughs> about, about the bureaucracy. About the bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, which, I, which is kind of rare for me. Mm -hmm. um, this is over at uh, JNU, which is the main uh, university mm -hmm. in Delhi, uh, right next to the statue of, of Nehru there. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the, the main, particularly for sort of foreign policy, history, economics, that's one of the main universities in India. And here I am in front of I think, the School of International Studies. The, the, the campus is interesting because mm -hmm. it, JNU is sort of a bastion of sort of Cold War sort of uh, traditional Indian sort of leftism oh, yeah, and yeah. things, and so the, the 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 campus has these wonderful, you know, like murals. And for for me, I mean, I have to admit, it's, it's kind of like it's like going back to like the seventies in a sense. <laughs> it's like smash imperialism, brothers, rise, you know, this kind of stuff. And it's 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 really interesting. So I tried to take some photos. So is that the this. dominant theme in in international studies in in, in India or? Traditionally, there's a strong in the university system. There's this strong sort of um, sort of third world um, uh, sort of leftism that yeah. you, you saw in many aspects. I mean, both in the West, mm -hmm. but also in a lot of the uh, in a lot of the developing world for the Cold War. So mm -hmm. that's the traditional sort of model, sort of yeah. disarmament. 
um, you know, anti-colonialism, yeah. this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Having said that, now as we've seen with Indian politics, you know, there's a rise of sort of a, uh, a Hindu revivalism, mm -hmm. which is interesting because it's, um, in some ways, it has parallels with a lot of, um, I mean, the, you know, a lot of the sort of conservative parties you have in, in the West, in the sense that it's it's merging religion, you know, with sort of free market economics, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, these types of things. Uh, and so that's also, you see an increase in that as well, mm -hmm. in a sense, mm -hmm. people who want a more sort of nationalist, um, free market yeah. sort of approach, were, but it's also part yeah. with a religious aspect as yeah, well. Yeah, so as in other countries, the, what they're studying really reflects, you know, kind of presentist re uh, concerns and cultural, you know, mm. uh, heritage at the same time. I think you can say that about any mm. um, IS or poli-sci or history in, in mm. any country, the trends follow kind of social right, developments and political developments at the time to a certain extent. Yeah. And, and oh, okay, looking very... Oh, as me with my Regal quarter. Here, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that's in front of Saftar Jung tomb. Oh, mm -hmm. um, uh, this is one of the Mughal tombs for these uh, mm -hmm. emperors. Uh, with actually, the, not for Saftar Jung, but they built a lot of these um, tombs in the same sort of architectural style that eventually goes to yeah. the, the Taj Mahal. Right. And one thing with the Mughals is, I mean, they just, they knew how to build. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the the buildings that they did, I mean, what, uh, spectacular. This is um, South Block. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the ministry buildings that the British built in the mm. th in the 30s around the president's house, which then was the viceroy's mm -hmm. house. And they're, an, again, an interesting architectural mix of sort of Mughal, yeah. Art Deco, yeah. it, British Imperial. Yeah, you can see the fusion, right, just in that <laughs> shot, yes, yeah, so, uh, of these two cultures kind of coming together, yeah, and a lot of other, yeah. Now, this I wanted to ask you about, because mm -hmm. I know, you know the, the, the guy who lived here was a particular kind of hero of yours, and mm -hmm. he was a, a man-eaten tiger hunter. <laughs> Turn conservationist. So, would you like to talk a little bit about? It's Jim Corbett, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very uh, nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, nicely done, <laughs> Allison. Um, yeah. Jim Corbett was this interesting guy. He was a. It was a Brit who was born in India, mm -hmm. uh, and his father, I believe, was a post office or railroad worker, and he grew up in the northern areas around uh, Nanital and Missouri, mm -hmm. up in. Uh, 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 I'm forgetting the name of the Indian state, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> you grew up around this area in these mm -hmm. cities. And Jim Corbett started off, um, you know, like most sort of British gentlemen sort of uh, out, out, in the, out in the hills. He started out as a hunter and other things. And one of the things that was interesting is he was often frequently called upon to, to hunt down man-eaters. Mm -hmm. So they would have these uh, issues with man-eating tigers, man-eating yeah. leopards, and he, and he was went out to go shoot them. And the thing that was interesting with Corbett, I mean, kind of like Teddy Roosevelt in a sense, mm -hmm. he became this great conservationist yeah. because as he saw over time, he saw the disappearance of habitat, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of the animals who would never be replaced in right. a sense uh, mm -hmm. in an area. And so he's the one who sort of founded the first sort of national park and mm -hmm. tiger reserve eventually uh, mm -hmm. in India, uh, the Corbett Reserve, which is over in that area. And that was a picture of one of his houses. He had a, a house for the winter and a house for the summer. And I believe that was the summer house, mm -hmm. Gurney house. And it's interesting, I had a funny, it was about two years ago I went and visited, I had an interesting experience because it's actually a private house, it's not a museum. Right. And there's a family that lives there, so you have to kind of knock on the gate and say, hey, you know, <laughs> and they'll let you come Oh, they'll let you come that's good. <laughs> and it was a really interesting mm -hmm. uh, a family that I, I met there, uh, and I, I visit them from time to time coming back when I visit India now. Uh, a, a, a woman and her husband, I believe it's from her husband's family, and she's a very well-known uh, Indian journalist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and things. So it was funny. I went there purely to see Jim Corbett's house, and next thing you know, I'm sitting there having tea with him, and she's asking me really tough questions about criticisms of Obama's foreign policy <laughs> and how we should resuscitate Indo-U.S. relations. Wow. And was not, you know, I was just there to take some photos, yeah, but yeah. not to have. But it was a really but, great conversation, yeah. a lot of fun, unexpected. Uh, kind of thing. So yeah, well, I I think you find the unexpected in that's it. That's right. <laughs> I think that's the place to go for that. So mm. like, so, and oh, we missed that one. But you were looking very dapper in your your cap there. So oh, I, I think that was uh, Nanital Lake. Oh, and that's yeah. around so where Gurney House is. Yeah. Oh, that's the same area there. And so they that's this very famous lake um, that's supposed to be one of the eyes. Um, 
uh, of, of, of an Indian goddess mm -hmm. during one of the uh, one of the name of the actual tale escapes me at this moment <laughs> uh, that landed there and mm -hmm. was supposedly then formed the lake was her eye and mm -hmm. so it's this very beautiful uh, hill hill station as you know from reading E. M. Forrester and uh, <laughs> I all wasn't going to bring that up <laughs> <laughs> all of these folks I and mean, one tradition that's kind of interesting that the British uh, introduced was again being from England mm -hmm. where it was colder uh, coming down to India uh, where it was very hot in the summer. They started this tradition in the 19th century of these hill stations uh, where basically they would move all of the government apparatus up to these high elevation heights mm -hmm. where the weather was cooler. Uh, and then once the British left, um, the middle class in India discovered that this was a really nice way to build vacations. Yeah. So when it's really hot in Delhi, a whole bunch of middle class people from, from India, uh, from Delhi, go up to these mm -hmm. hill stations in a sense the same fashion of way that the British did mm -hmm. 100 years ago. And so Nanital is one of these uh, areas uh, up, in the, up in the hills and the weather is quite pleasant mm -hmm. uh, in the summertime. Okay. Well, Dr. Bratton, <laughs> it was a pleasure speaking to you and uh, this is your last program, very sadly. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I wish you every luck in whatever you're going to do and come back and speak to us when you re when you return with uh, more information about more of your adventures wherever they're going to take you. Okay. So thank you for uh, being with us uh, and we'll see you next week at Think Tech Hawaii Global Connections. Goodbye. <laughs>